Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning to the neighborhood and good morning to those that are with us. Do we have any uh, visitors with us? Oh, here comes the wind. If you do, if we do, give us a honk. Any visitors? <laughs> no honking? Hold on. Well, before we begin here, I just want to give us a couple of announcements. If you, if you don't know me, my name is Pastor Luke, and I just am so happy that you are here with us this morning, and we thank God for the clouds a little bit today. But just kind of an update on where we are going with uh, this service and with our reopening plans uh, we are planning on to continue to do the drive-in church and to really lean into this model for the time during the summer. Um, so we're going to be doing this through June and July. And yes, we know that it will get hot, most likely, like it has been. So we are hoping to, do, to get a canopy for us up here. But we also encourage you, if you can, it's particularly on hot days, um, to have your car running with your air conditioning if you can, or to find shade Get to bring a lawn chair, bring lots of water, um, just in case things do get too hot. We don't want to have anyone get into any kind of trouble. Once again, we also are on the radio. If you are in the distance on 97.1, we're hoping to make that a better and better experience. But so service in the building will probably not be happening until the beginning of August, August 4th. And then, but the church officially will be open to the public on June 8th, but that means that we will be having some uh, guidelines as to what it means to do things in the church and how to interact in the church. That has been sent out in our newsletter. Uh, just be sure to wear a mask, to wash up after yourselves. All of the tables in the fellowship hall and the bathrooms are, go are continuously uh, being cleaned after uses. Um, there are little cards actually in there on the table. So if you come to prayer meeting, which we do encourage you to come to on Wednesdays at noon, uh, we have done every precaution to keep you safe, so we do encourage you to come to prayer meeting. Please, please come and pray with us, 12 noon in the Fellowship Hall. We spread out, everyone wears a mask, and we definitely clean off the tables. But join us in prayer, if you will. And then also, please continue to join us on our Zoom Bible study, which is a continuation of what we are doing uh, this morning. It's a continuation of digging into the scriptures, and that is 6 p.m. on Wednesdays. Any of you can join the Zoom. We have actually people joining the Zoom from not even in this church, from people all the way out in the middle of Kansas who have been able to join us. And it's been a wonderful time um, of scripture reading. So please join us for that. And with that being said, let's pray and we'll jump into what God has planned for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us, to be all around us. And Lord God, we ask for your will to be done. Most importantly, Lord, here and in our neighborhood, God. And, and we pray for this morning, Lord, for our city and for cities around the nation, Lord, right now that are hurting and people that are hurting, Lord Jesus. We do ask for your justice to roll down like a river, Lord God, but we pray for peace, Lord Jesus. We pray for peace on the hearts and minds, Lord, of your people. And Lord, we pray for leaders to rise up, God, who speak your words, your true words, Lord God. And we ask for safety, Lord Jesus, for all who are in harm's way right now, Lord. And we pray that you're, you would work on our hearts, God, today, and help us to see your love and your love for one another that is because of you and the unity that we should have in the spirit and Lord Jesus, how your kingdom is an earthly, global kingdom, God. You've opened up paradise for all who call upon your name. And for that, we love you and praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Today we look at question seven from the New City Catechism as we profess what we believe. What does the law of God require? Personal, perfect, and perpetual obedience that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. What God forbids should never be done and what God commands should always be done. We're going to sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and I think it's a wonderful song for us to sing this morning and to be reminded that, yes, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what the Prince of Darkness Grim has to throw at us, we can hide in the fortress of Christ, and we know that there is a firm foundation there. So I encourage you to just sing this song boldly and loudly. Let's sing. says the body they may kill but his truth abideth still God's truth does abide and it continues 
to abide. And we do celebrate this day, Pentecost Sunday. And just as the sun has broke forth for us, the disciples saw on that day when the tongues of fire reached out to them and changed their hearts forevermore. And they were able to go out into the streets and it all clicked and everything Jesus had prepared for them and the resurrection that had, had just they had seen, it all came together in this moment of Pentecost when the church began and it continues today. And so as we heard, as how the Spirit fell upon them, we know that the Apostle Peter, he went out in the streets and he began to preach. He began to preach the gospel, to preach repentance, to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified in the kingdom of God. It's continuously our message. We should continue to preach in a likewise manner. And it says this, our call to confession comes directly from this passage. It's a wonderful one from Acts chapter 2, 36 through 39. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. So if you're hearing the Spirit reach out to you today, beloved. Hear the words of the Apostle Peter. Repent and be washed and be baptized. All of you, all that hear this call. So with that being said, let's repent. For we have much to repent of Let's silently confess to the Father. Lord God, we thank you for the wellspring of life that you poured out on us in the Holy Spirit. And Lord God, we do repent and we do confess, Lord, that we have too often allowed sin to rule in our hearts and have allowed too often for the old man, the flesh, Lord, to have priority number one, Lord. And we don't want that to be. We confess and we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. And we know that we are only able to be forgiven because of what Jesus has done. And we, we plead his obedience, Lord God, the obedience that he showed to the cross. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would continue to show us our sin and how we can be changed by your spirit. And Lord God, how we can continue to preach this message of compassion through Jesus, but also repentance. We thank you for the assurance that comes through Jesus and through your holy word. It's in the name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Here again, the assurance of pardon from Colossians and Galatians chapter 2. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught overflowing with thankfulness. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. We're gonna sing the wonderful hymn with the, with the refrain, My Chains Are Gone of Amazing Grace. And just so you know, I, I wanna give a little shout out. This song was put together, um, it was an adaptation of what John Newton had written, um, who was a part of, uh, he was a good friend of a man named William Wilberforce, and there was, an, uh, it was a tre 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 tremendous movie that was actually made about their life story called Amazing Grace. I really encourage you to watch it, but if you know anything about Wilberforce and the life of John Newton, um, Wilberforce was one of the main players who helped abolish the slave trade in the United Kingdom and has a tremendous story and was tremendously moved by God, him and many others who worked so hard to make that happen. And it's such a 
wonderful reminder of God's grace for all of us. Well, thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> Power issue. Anyway, as I was saying, I do encourage you to look up the movie Amazing Grace. It's a wonderful movie and speaks clearly to today. So let's sing this together.
until my chains are gone. My chains are gone. I can set free. Amen. My God, my Savior has rescued me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. I am being Go to a time of prayer. Merciful God, our Heavenly Father, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we worship you. We give you all the glory, Lord Jesus. Lord God, cause ourself to decrease so that you can increase. Lord God, crush our pride. Humble us, Lord. Take away anything and everything that stands in the way of you. Lord God, may this be a platform. May this church be a platform, a terminal, God, for going into where you have sent us. May it never be a destination and may it never be a stage, Lord, but a platform. Lord, help us to resist that temptation, Lord. Help this pastor to resist that temptation. Lord, I pray for each and every individual here, Lord, that they would be prompted to step out and forward, Lord, into their sphere of influence that you have called them into, Lord God. I pray for each family connection and family tie and for each husband and wife that may not be here, Lord God, that you would continue to use them, Lord, first and foremost to reach their families for who you are and for the gospel, Lord God. I pray that you would show each person here the one step that they can take, Lord, to reach the lost person most close to them, Lord, that you love and that you are calling. Lord, make each person here a mouthpiece for you. Lord God, we do pray just like what happened so many years ago at Pentecost, Lord, that you would continue to fall fresh on us with tongues of fire, Lord, but not just us, but our country. Lord Jesus, we know that you are saying, and you have been saying, and you say in your scripture, if we will humble ourselves and repent and look to you, Lord, you will renew our lands. You will renew our hearts. And Lord Jesus, it is for that that we do pray for our country, Lord. You see it, Lord. You know it's on our minds. You know that it's something we are anxious about. And Lord God, we do pray for those who have felt disenfranchised, Lord, who have been tread upon for many years, Lord God. We do pray for justice. And Father, we ask that you would continue to mold us into Christ likeness, Lord Father, that we can address, Lord, what you are calling us to address and we can seek justice through the Christ way, Father. But we do pray for the leaders, Lord, that are having to deal with tough situations. Lord God, would your spirit be upon them and they would speak truth. Lord God, would you be with all of our, those, Lord, who may be protesting, Lord, make them, give them a spirit of peace. Lord God, may they, may they work in peaceful Christ-like ways, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for our first responders, Lord, who have to go into harm's way. We do pray for our, our law enforcement, Lord God, that you would protect them and their families and that they would have a spirit of peace. And Lord God, that they would seek true justice. And Lord God, for Lord the military that is in harm's way, Lord, for all the workers, 
in their businesses. Lord God, we do pray for those people, God, that you have put in there. Lord, would you show us how we can respond to it, Lord God? Would you rise up the church to respond to the situation? Lord, we know that you are always calling us to the situation to bring Jesus to the stage, the platform. Lord God, we want Jesus to be glorified somehow through this time, Lord Jesus. May you take this time of hurt and confusion and use it as an opportunity to bring revival, to bring a fresh Pentecost, Lord, upon our hearts. Stir us up, Lord God. We know we need to be stirred up. Stir us up, Lord, in righteousness. Lord God, we want to be stirred to the righteous things of Christ, Lord. And we know that you are working and we therefore repent and say, God, come in whatever way you want and whatever way you seem is good, Lord. By whatever leadership you seem is good, Lord, we say, do it. But Lord, strengthen our hands. And Lord God, we do pray for those amongst our congregation and our community who are hurting and are struggling, Lord, with physical ailments, Father who are depressed, who are anxious, Lord, we, we ask for your peace to be upon them. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, take away depression, take away anxiety, take away fear in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we cast out the devil who wants to use this moment, Lord, for his glory. Lord, we stand against him. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would cast the devil out of our communities. That you would cast evil, Lord, out of each city in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, for those that are suffering physically, Lord, we ask that you would show your will through them and that you would heal, Father, anyone who is suffering with physical pain. And we know there are many. And Lord, we ask for those who are suffering with cancer in our church, Lord, that you would heal them in the name of Jesus if it be your will. You would take away their pain, Lord. And Lord, even if not, even if there is not healing, Lord, we ask that your glory would be revealed through the suffering. For we know that is the way you have done everything, Lord. It is through our sufferings that you will reveal yourself completely. And Lord Jesus, we ask that today you would speak to us by your word. That we would not stay the same people, but would leave as a different people more and more like Jesus. We want to know you. We want to know you rightly, for it changes everything. We thank you for the prayer you gave us, saying these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. beloved my heart as a, as a pastor today is uh, continuously heavy as we've been praying about for what is going on in the country and I do ask you to continue to pray but this is an important time for us to have um, good conversations with one another and to be real with one another and to seek out truth where it may be found first and foremost, as it is found in the scripture, but I do think this is a time for us to lament, but to also look forward to the hope we have in Jesus. But with any time that there is a struggle going on and there's chaos, we as Christians have hope. And we have the ability to bring hope. And I ask you to not, 
I just encourage you from a pastoral perspective to not get completely weighed down by maybe what the world shows you on the TV screen or in the newspaper, but to first go to your spheres of influence, those you know that may be impacted by what's going on, and to have honest conversations and ask the Lord how you can respond to the chaos. And I fully believe that our Heavenly Father is asking for each individual church to continue to show love, to seek Christ, His mercies, His compassions, where we are planted, and to pray for and continues to support those around the nation and other churches that are, that are struggling. But it's important that we continue to be the bridge. The church is the ultimate bridge in every neighborhood. And so we need to continue to just reach the lost and not, not, be for, not forget the, what we wage against is our spiritual principalities and the devil himself that wants to divide us and to cause us harm. But beloved, we need to be looking out for each and every person that the Lord has brought into our flock and therefore care about what is hurting them or is causing them pain because it's in the nature of Jesus to go after and to seek out the most hurt, lost, lonely, desperate, lost causes. And I think that's part of the beauty of what today's passage is about from Mark chapter 5. So today we are continuing in Mark. This is our first passage from the, uh, the fifth chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 20. So as you are turning there, I will read for us. So Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And this is the place last time we talked about Jesus crossed over the lake, the Sea of Galilee, in the storm. And this is where Jesus was taking them. This is where he wanted to go right away. All right, the word of the Lord, if you wouldn't mind, raise your hand for the God's word. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerenices. When Jesus got out of the boat... A man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees and worshiped. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, do not torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. Jesus gave them permission. And the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave the region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. The word of the Lord. 
This story is very similar to the last passage of Jesus calming the storm. It has similar elements in Mark chapter 4. Once again, we are shown the character and the authority of Jesus Christ. These stories are not about us, okay? These stories are not about us. They are a little bit, but not completely. I don't believe that's the central piece of what they are. And I've heard a lot of sermons, not that they're wrong, but have focused on the us, on how to overcome, or 10 steps on how to overcome spiritual oppression or something of this nature. Not wrong, but I don't think that's necessarily what is being told to us here. Similar to the last story, it's about Jesus. It's about God. His true character is being revealed. Jesus is allowing events, events that we can write down, stories, dramatic stories at that, to reveal his identity. He lets others do the talking, even demons. The character of Jesus is essential. It's essential for us to understand. We were talking about this in our open table, table Bible study, and I was encouraging others, you know, just simply go to Google and type in Bible verses about the character of God. It's so important that we know the character in the same way you should know the character of your parent or your friend. Why do you trust? Why do you love them? Well, you know them. You know their love, their mercy, their power, their authority. So they're continuously, the disciples are learning about the character of Jesus. And that's something that we need to continue to hold on to. It's our bedrock. It's essential. It's essential for in times of trouble for us to know the character of God. Because if God is known and his character is seen as this God who's a mean kid on the anthill, right? Or who isn't paying attention or who doesn't care or who is just sleeping, then we're going to lose hope. If he's a distant God who, who doesn't understand our pain, who doesn't understand our suffering, then we're going to lose hope. But we know that that's not true. He's a God who is acquainted with sufferings. He's a God who is acquainted with friendships, with love, with food and drink. Last week we talked about specifically the holiness of Jesus and the power of Jesus. There are many lessons that can be learned from this passage, but today I want to zoom in on the compassion of Jesus. I think it's important for us to look at this today. Now, be reminded in this passage that Jesus, it shows, and it's been continuing the show, remember, because he's the lion gospel, not a wimp, that Jesus is unafraid of the darkest places. He's unafraid of the stormy seas. He's unafraid of dark tombs. He's unafraid of a legion of demons. He's unafraid of the greatest of sinners. No one intimidates Jesus. Jesus is unafraid to redeem the very least of these. Jesus sought out, possibly in this passage, the most unclean, hopeless, lost cause on the planet. And I do mean that. Beloved, it is the character of Jesus to save lost causes. Hear that again. It is in the character of Jesus to go after and to save what the world would call a lost cause. The business of Jesus, I think, given to us from this passage is three things. It is, number one, to save and call those who are lost. Number two, to make himself known among the Gentiles, among the nations. And number three, to send back the redeemed with a testimony. So it's one, to save and call those who are lost, make himself known among the nations, and to send us back with a testimony. So number one, to save and call the lost. How does this passage show that Jesus is saving and call the lost? Well, I want to give you a couple of scriptures to help us to see that this is true. This isn't just Luke talking, but this is, in fact, the mission of Jesus. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. 1 Timothy, the Apostle Paul speaking, chapter 1, verse 15 says, This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. 
John 3, 16, the wonderful verse many of us know. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then Mark 10, verse 45, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This man is example number one. This man who is possessed by the demons is example number one in many unmistakable ways of a lost person. Jesus could not have made his ministry any clearer. One of the worst things to be as a Jew, and remember, Jesus a Jew, Jewish context, disciples as Jews, is to be unclean. And there are many ways one can be unclean. The man mentioned in Mark 5 was lost to the Gentiles, but was also quite the sight for the Jews. First of all, they were in a Gentile region now, which was bizarre, particularly for the disciples. But the man here is unclean just from a Jewish perspective in four profound ways. Number one, he's possessed by a legion of demons. Now help me understand, you know, a legion, a Roman legion could be as many as 6,000 people. And we know that it can be less than that. It can be a grouping, a large grouping. We know it at least was 2,000, but they cannot, you know, by the way that they went into the pigs, 2,000 pigs. But that's a whole lot of demons. That's a powerful way to be unclean. Number two reason this man was unclean, he lived in the tombs among dead things. He was a Gentile, number three reason. And number four reason, he lived next to pigs. This man was as unclean as it gets in the most profound ways one can be unclean. And that's not to say what we know exactly what his charges were as to why he was being chained by the Gentiles. You understand? This man most likely was a criminal. He most likely had done some incredibly nasty things. I mean, you can only imagine when someone is possessed by that much demonic influence what they're capable of. But even the Gentiles in the Decapolis, the 10 cities, were afraid of this man and found him to be unworthy to be around and a person who deserves to be chained up in the graveyard. And we know a lot about that in Greek time. A lot of things were okay. So for this man to be chained up, he had probably some serious issue. And, I'm, and it's hard for us because we are so detached from this story. But this man was hated. Hated. And, and we need to think about, you know, there's, there's people right now in the world, even what's going on with the situation in Minneapolis, where you look at uh, what happened with this officer who killed this young man. There's obviously, and rightly so, some incredible anger towards that person who did that. And I think you need to see in some ways, and, and, and I'll, I'll be careful here, that that's kind of the way this man was viewed, a person worthy of being chained to the tombs and forgotten and, if possible, killed. He was that messed up. He was the lost of the lost. The disciples, of course, would have been horrified by this going on. They would have been confused, most likely, at Jesus taking them there. Yet the teaching continued. The demon-possessed man, he had a miserable life, not only to be a cast-out religious, but also by the pagans. He was physically tortured as well as mentally. He cut himself and lived a life of continual screaming and rage. Do any of you know someone like this? Inevitably, someone comes to mind. I ask you to look closer. Maybe it was you. Perhaps it is you. Beloved, in, in, a, in a strong way, this man's life is a picture of sin. It's a picture of what sin does to all of us. Sin chains us to the tombs. It's easy to say, oh my, look at that guy. At least I'm not like him. What a mess. And it's true, certain sin have different consequences, of course, but we cannot 
and should not separate where we were before Jesus saved us. Before Jesus plucked us out of the darkest of pits. And we should not and cannot separate ourselves from the influence of unrepentant sin in our lives. It's destructive. It separates everything from us. Beloved, we are or were in a very real way this man in our sin. We may not have been physically demon possessed, although we were sin possessed. We may not live physically in the graveyard, although our soul did. Jesus can and Jesus will redeem us. Jesus can and will redeem us from this state. Jesus traveled over the stormy night to seek this man out. One sinner, beloved, is vastly important to God. And Jesus sought after the most miserable of lost causes to make a point that his redemption has no bounds. It goes to the lowest level of hell. There are none too far from the reach of Jesus to redeem. Listen to this truth, even from King David himself in Psalm chapter 40, when he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me. He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the muck and the mire. And he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. You can imagine, just as it was for David, who was saved and protected by the Lord, even David, who, was, who sinned in a profound, in a terrible way. David was a murderer, and the Lord lifted him out of the mud. You can imagine this man who was demon-possessed saying the same things. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the muck and the mire and the mud. Beloved, you have to see that if you have placed your faith in Jesus, he has done the same for you. We mustn't distance ourselves from the severity of our sins. Number two, through this passage, Jesus is making himself known among the Gentiles. He's making himself known among the nations. Romans chapter 15 said, Christ became a servant to the circumcised, that is the Jews, to show God's truthfulness, his promise in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs like Abraham, and in order that the Gentiles, that is everyone who is not Jewish, might glorify God for his mercy, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. When the nation of Israel was established, and before the nation of Israel was established, humanity continued to rebel against God, we see the creation, we see Adam and Eve and their fall, and the world goes into this chaotic state, and the things that were good became bad. The people of God became scattered all across the, all across the globe after the Tower of Babel, an attempt from God. God scattered the people because the people were attempting to be like God, to reach to God. Corruption was all about the face of the earth, as it says in Genesis 6. And many people groups had come under the influence of lesser gods, as it says in Deuteronomy 32, 88 through 1. They became under the influence of demonic gods that we see, people like the Baals, all throughout the scriptures. God had disinherited his people, as it says in Deuteronomy 32. Yahweh, therefore then, begins to take his chosen people. As the people are scattered, as, this, as after the Tower of Babel and, and, and sin is corrupt, the people are scattered across the globe, and, Jesus, and the Lord, Lord God, Yahweh, says, I will there set apart a people of my own. This would become the people of Israel. And through this people, I will redeem once again the nations. He chose Abraham to be that person who would lead this. And he made a covenant promise with him and with the people of Israel that they would be the means of salvation for the lost. The people would be regrouped. They would be reclaimed by the great shepherd Jesus. There will be a Messiah who will crush the head of the snake and who will regroup his people. 
And to show that this has been God's purpose from generations past, Paul in Romans 15, looking back on the ministry of Jesus, quotes 2 Samuel, Deuteronomy, Psalms, and Isaiah. God's mission is to be glorified among all the nations. First Paul quotes 2 Samuel says, I will praise you among the nations and sing to your name. Then he quotes Deuteronomy 32, 43 and says, Rejoice, O nations, with his people. Then Psalm 117, 1, Praise the Lord, all nations. Let all the people praise him. And finally he quotes Isaiah 11, Verse 10, the root of Jesse shall come and he who will rises to rule the nations and him shall the nations hope. So even from the prophets of old, from the original promise, it was not just for the Jews, but through the Jews would be the redemptive principle to the nations. And Jesus is showing quite clearly here in this passage to this lost man, this lost Gentile man, that yes, Jesus has come. He's the great shepherd and he will regroup that which was lost to him from the beginning of time. The point of these Old Testament quotations in Romans 15 shows that God's purpose in dealing with Israel was always, always to reach the nations and to be glorified in them for his mercy, first through the Jew, then to the Gentile. Therefore, when God sent Christ into the world, the purpose was not only to confirm his promises to Israel, but to cause the nations to glorify. Jesus puts this truth on full display with not a decent, pretty good Gentile, which he could have done. And maybe some of the Jews would have gone, okay, well, maybe he can join the club. He seems like a pretty good guy. No, he goes to the furthest from him, this demon-possessed man. And finally, what we learn from this passage is that Jesus always sends us back with a testimony. And he sent this man back to his own people, the Gentiles, with a testimony. The man who was possessed wanted to join Jesus, as it says. He wanted to join the disciples. But we know the timing was not yet ready for Gentile to join the disciples. Besides, this man had a purpose concerning his own people. And I think we should hear this today, beloved. Jesus says to them, go and tell how much the Lord has done for you. Through his testimony, the people were amazed and they were also afraid, which is always going to be the case with your testimony, beloved. You're either going to amaze people and they will glorify God or they're going to be really offended and you're going to inconvenience them and they're going to kick you out of town. Anytime we speak the truth of Jesus, because why the truth of Jesus and what he has to do for our life is an absolute. And it tells us that we need to repent and get right. And that's the number one thing that we don't like as humans is being told that we're accountable to something. And accountability has very much been lost in religion. And there's a lot of religions out there that you can join and make you feel good that have zero accountability. And that's not the way it is with Christianity. And therefore, when you go back, beloved, believe that there are people that need to hear your testimony of what Jesus has done for you in the same way that people needed to hear it from this man. And not everyone is going to be happy with it. And some people are going to be more upset about the loss of pigs than the transformation of your life. The scripture was fulfilled in this man. It was beginning to show the returning of the nations. So he, therefore, needed to return to his own people. This is the same for us. Our first mission is to where we have been planted. Your first mission, church, is to your family. Does your family know Jesus? And you know, the number one way you can reach your family, it's not by smacking them over the head of the Bible. It's giving them your testimony. Telling them what Jesus has done for you. This is your first mission field. Start there. Mother Teresa you know, said once when a man interviewed her and said, how, Mother Teresa, can we be like you and do what you did? And Mother Teresa said, do you know your neighbor? Beloved, if each and every one of us reached our kids, our husband, our wife, our mom, our dad, and then our neighbor, oh man, it's over. You understand? This is what Jesus is calling us to do. And 
is what he called for this man to do. Reach your neighbor. Don't come with me and go into a context you don't understand, a language you don't speak. Go to the one you know, the one you understand. And if God calls you out into a different place, to a different culture, a different language, let God tell you, let him be direct. For example, some of you may know the story of St. Patrick of Ireland. He was a 5th century a man born in what is present day England. He was captured by Irish slave traders. He became a slave in Ireland, lived there for many years. Patrick was given the opportunity to escape from Ireland. He left, went home to England, was a Christian, became a stronger Christian, but he was moved by the Holy Spirit to go back to the people he grew up with, essentially. Ireland and his slave captors have become more of his family than was in England. But he was told to go back to the people that enslaved him, to preach to his once captors. Amazing. Not, who could do that? Through his testimony and ministry of going back and testimony of what God had done in his life, the whole island of Ireland would come under Christ's rule. There was a massive revival that happened in that time because really of what God had done in the testimony of St. Patrick. The same is essentially true for the Apostle Paul. Only he was the oppressor. Paul was a man under demonic influences until Jesus, just like we see here with this man who was possessed by legion, came into his life and sent him back with a new mission. Paul was a lost cause, beloved, but not to Jesus. It's important to note that God has chosen to reach the world via lost causes. Why? Because of the testimony. Because the glory that it gives Jesus. You know, when, when God said to Gideon, Gideon, your army's too large. It needs to be 300, not 32,000. Why? Because you might think you did it for the glory of God. The original missionaries were ex-lepers. <laughs> Disabled, unclean, zealots, tax collectors, and demon-possessed. Who better to testify to those who know and know the power of God and have seen with their own eyes how God has transformed them? It's so dynamic. It's so visible. Who know where people have been. Everyone in that town, in the Decapolis, knew about that guy. The people could not deny, therefore, God's awesome power in the once demon-possessed man. They probably said, is this not the crazy guy? Is that not the guy who was chained up? Is that not the guy who did this and that? Is that not the guy who killed so-and-so? Was he not on the verge of death? What happened? Who is this that healed him? Remember last time in chapter 4, the disciples were forced to ask, who is this? Well, through our testimonies, beloved, people are forced to ask that question. Who is this? Why? Because as it says in Galatians 2.20, I have no longer lived, but it is Christ who liveth in me. And that is why we stand here and pray, Lord God, may it not be us that is seen, not to us, God, but to your name's sake. May Christ be seen through His what he has done in us, through our testimony, through the transfiguration of who we are, through us being crucified on the cross, through our old self being done away with, and then a man sitting here in his right mind, fully clothed, the people can only marvel and say, who is this? Well, I'll tell you who it is, beloved. It's Jesus in a real way. When you've been saved and placed your faith on him and been healed by him, people see Jesus. And as we know, these things were done so that others could believe. As John chapter 20, verse 31 says, these things, all these stories were written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the son of God. It has been said by non-believers, beloved. I'm not interested in your redeemer when you don't look very redeemed. Beloved, we better look redeemed. There better be a change in our countenance. There better be a change. People who say, man, he's fully clothed and in his right mind. Let people be drawn to Jesus, as we talked about last week, because of what they see in us. Not drawn to us. Not a cult of personality. Not a, ooh, this is a new lifestyle change. No, may Jesus be glorified. We should smell of new life. We should be clothed and not naked. Clothed with resurrection authority. People should see such a difference in us that they are struck with the fear of God. As it says twice in this passage, verse 15 and 20. 
It talks about how the people marveled. Christ has passed on to the church his mission to seek and to save. As long as this age lasts, our command from Jesus is to tell of his salvation with our lips and to show his love with our lives so that people from every tongue, every tribe, and every nation, as it says in Revelation 7, 9, will be saved by faith and give him glory for his mercy. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Go. This means that the unfinished mission of Jesus Christ has been given to us to seek and to save the lost so that redeemed people from every nation will glorify him for his mercy. That incomplete mission is our mission. Not just the apostles. It's not just for them. It's not just for the pastors. Not just for the clergy or the elders or the deacons. But yours and mine as those who have been saved and, sought and, and given life through the faith of Jesus. Therefore, beloved, hear the words, if, you, if this is true of you, go and tell what Jesus has done for you. So it's important for us to remember that the, Jesus is to save and seek the lost. He's making himself known continuously to this day to the Gentiles and to the nations. And he's sending you with a testimony to your closest neighbors. You know, I, there's a great song. I'll finish with this that uh, I love by B.B. King and, and you too from Bono called When Love Comes to Town. And I can only imagine this was kind of a, probably the, what this man might have been singing that day when Jesus came out of that boat. When love comes to town, I'm going to jump that train. When love comes to town, I'm going to catch that flame. Maybe I was wrong to ever let you down, but I did what I did. That was before love came to town. Beloved, love has come to town. Jump that train, amen? Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the truth in your scripture, the living truth of Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we do pray that these words and this passage of scripture, Lord, from Mark would take root the seed would be in our hearts, Lord, and it would make fruit, Lord God. I pray that you would inspire each person here today to go back to their home and to their neighborhood and to tell about what you have done so mercifully for us. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to sing another classic Gaither style song, so get ready to clap and dance and do si do. Because we are the we are redeemed people, beloved. Amen. Let's not be somber.
just came into my heart And the gates of the sea beyond I can see Tell somebody about Jesus and how he came into your heart and how he changed your life forevermore. Go back to your people, your neighborhood, your family and speak the truth to him, knowing that no one is too far for the love of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we do all these things. Amen. Amen. Oh, and I do want to remind everybody next week we will be taking communion. Um, what we're going to be doing is we have little disposable pre-packaged communion cups and wafers, and we're going to hand them out as you drive in. You don't, you know, obviously it's a sacrament that we want to continue to remind you to take in faith only, but also if you are still concerned about anything, we don't want to make you feel pressured about it, but we will have communion. Thank God. It's such a wonderful thing. And I look forward to drinking of that cup and eating of that bread with you. God bless.